and welcome back welcome aboard the part train i'm ev this is serm what's up guys guys serm this is a good good podcast this is a good episode you guys are gonna love it but in case you guys are new we help frustrated golfers enjoy the ride again because if you can learn to smile through bad golf you can smile through anything we had keith bennett one of my favorite coaches on instagram and youtube on the podcast to basically do a mailbag episode we got through like 10 what we call passengers on the trains questions um some of our followers questions and we had a really great rapid fire discussion so really every part of the game was covered long game short game mental physical so awesome um if you guys are looking to play better golf this year this episode's for you if you like it hop aboard the channel now and subscribe and no matter where your ball's going sir what do they got to do just enjoy the ride enjoy the ride guys take care thanks guys Keith Bennett, one of our favorite people. We met in Arizona at the True Links event. Welcome aboard the Par Train, my man. We're pumped to have you. I am pumped to be here. Yeah, I uh, our paths crossed uh, kind of randomly there on one of those tee boxes. I can't remember what hole it was, but uh, a little walk and talk, uh, course management, sort of how you're going to play this hole. It was kind of a cool, you know, dealer's choice par four. Where you could either try to drive the green or you could lay it up and have like a a bit of an awkward wedge shot in and uh yeah who knew who knew we would uh you know keep in touch and uh we'd end up on the pod so i'm, I'm stoked it's full circle keith yeah. it's good to see you Abby was the only guy who pulled out iron or driving iron and it's, actually put it yeah, in play <laughs> whoever he was going for it with driver and hitting in the water you know that experiment <laughs> keith just to give people context in case they don't know what we're talking about that that series swing thought series where yeah. we challenge you to make a par I think it was hole 14, maybe. Yeah, whatever I that short par four. It was a short par four, water left. And yeah, okay. it was so fascinating looking back on that. We might even get to this as we get <laughs> to these questions. I'll get to the mailbag format in a second. But it wasn't it so eye-opening, sir, how different Keith approached this hole than the 12 and the 10, even, even, even the 5. Even the 5. Yeah. Even the 5. Camps, it was... Yeah. I think uh, I forget his name, but we had like a one handicap um, yeah. and Keith, who, what are you now, Keith? Are you plus three? I got to be somewhere in the plus three, plus four range okay. currently. Yeah. So what was so fascinating about that was the five, the 10 and the 12, or maybe it was just a five and a 12. I don't remember, but they hit driver off that T yeah. and they just treated that hole like it was an easy kind of hole and i'll never forget keith talking about how hard this 70 yard shot was with a little downhill lie i i wouldn't even have noticed that that lie was downhill a little wind i barely felt the wind and you talked about how challenging it was and you played four iron to put it in play because it was the percentage shot it wasn't even a question for you to go driver and it's just it's it's Fascinating to me how the better players acknowledge the difficulty, but the worst players assume it's going to be easy. It's interesting. Yeah. And I, th- I think some of that too, like when I reflect, when I fl- reflect back on some of that stuff or just tournaments that I've played in general, like sometimes ignorance is bliss a little bit too, you know, like yeah. I heard Jason day, Jason day said something about this the other day. He's like, when you play golf at someone else's home course and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just hit it up the right hand side here. And they don't really know how far you hit it. And then you, you pipe a drive. Cause you're just thinking about a target that they gave you. And then you get up there and you squeeze the driver through this little 10 yard window between like water and, and bunker. And they're like, Oh man, I didn't think you'd hit it that far. And you're like, yeah, yeah looking back, I wouldn't hit driver, <laughs> but you smoke driver. And now you've got like a wedge in your hand. So like, I think golf is an interesting mix of, yes, there's analytics. Yes, there's the percentages and all that, which I'm, you know, I I adhere to a lot, but I think sometimes ignorance is bliss is like, you got to ride that knife sedge a little bit of like, you know, what could go right here instead of what could go wrong. And then also understanding, well, if I'm going to play this shot a hundred times, there's a good chance I'm going to tug my driver into that water on that par four. 50 of them. Right. And that's not the best odds, uh, for, for, a you know, a healthy strategy long-term. Totally. So right. like I told you off air, Keith, normally we do the mailbag, just Serm and I today's fun. Today's special. We brought Keith on. Who's a great coach. You guys got to follow him at Keith Bennett golf. Um, 
before we dig into, we're going to try and get to as many of these questions as we can. Any context you want to give people other than obviously what we're going to say in the intro um, that will give people a good idea of either your philosophy, you as a golfer, then transition to a coach. I think that'd be helpful before we dig in. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, so I played golf at New Mexico State. Um, my, my background is actually in professional snowboarding. So I was a professional snowboarder until I was like 18. Some injuries caught up with me um, and that was just kind of fizzling out and, and golf was turning into a passion at that point. So I got into the golf program at New Mexico State. Um, I walked my way onto the golf team a couple of years later just through hard work and playing some good events um, and then tried to play professionally right out of college. And I think that that couple of years of trying to play professionally really made me a better teacher because I really just learned from the mistakes that I made um, and how I approached the game. Um, you know, as far as technique goes, I was very, uh, internally focused on like body part motion, you know, this, this arm should move this way. This knee needs to move this amount. This hip needs to move this amount. Um, and it, that wasn't how I played other sports and there was a conflict mentally for me. So I came out of that, a better player, um, was introduced to some really good mentors of mine, Henry Statina and, uh, Ed LeBeau, who introduced me to more of, a what's called an external focus. So focusing more on the target, what the club is doing, um, what I want the golf ball to do. And that resonated uh, really, really well. And I started playing some of my best golf. Um, And then I was introduced more to course management side of things like Scott Fawcett's decade system and Mark Brody. I read Mark Brody's book, Every Shot Counts. And that opened my eyes to, hey, I don't have to be perfect on the golf course. It's actually managing my my bad shots and, and understanding where the center of my dispersion pattern is going to be. And those two things just took my game to a whole new level and took my coaching to, to a really, uh, you know, good place. And, and that's kind of what brought me here today. And those are like pretty much the core tenets of what I teach is like human beings learn best when they're thinking about the tool that's in their hand, right? You think about what the fork is going to do, not what your wrist is doing to move the fork. You think about moving the spoon to your lips, not about, you know, pronation and supination and, and of your forearm to do it. Um, so that's how we learn to use tools as humans. And so a golf club is a tool. We need to learn how to move the club to move the ball. Cause after all the clubs, the only thing hitting the ball. Um, and so like that just all made so much sense. And that's how we learn as humans. And then, you know, tying that in with, I don't have to be perfect when I hit shots. And that took a lot of weight off my shoulders, understanding dispersion patterns and so kind of in a little summary, that's, that's basically like the core beliefs of kind of what I teach. And, you know, there's some flexibility within there, but that's, that's more or less what it is. Well, I think this is going to be perfect for this conversation and for these questions too, Keith, because you got to get the, you know, a lot of these people wrote into us or, you know, maybe are obviously struggling with something in their game. Right. Yep. But get them, get them back to playing golf, maybe too much thinking about golf. Right. Like, so. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Keith, my coach literally just told me on I we we're, we were talking on the phone a few days ago and he says we just got to make sure that when you're driving your golf car down the road, meaning I'm playing a round of golf, I got to get behind the wheel and drive. I can't have my yeah. head in the hood. Yeah. While I'm I love while that. the car is moving. You know what I mean? Yep. Um which I thought was a really great um analogy we might need to do a whole other episode on snowboarding because when you said that i forgot that you did pro snowboarding yeah and i've had some interesting and scary experiences where i could not commit to the speed that i was going and i got into a pretty gnarly uh (laughs) crash into a tree in the uh oh dang i didn't know that in the powder and i couldn't get out and i was alone in the forest that's a story for another time but Holy, there's a I gotta lot hear of, this. Yeah, we got to talk off. Can I just tell it real quick? <laughs> so real quick story before we get into the questions. Yeah. I was with my buddies in Winter Park. Um, who One of my buddies from growing up lives there. And they are all, you know, I'm a decent snowboarder. I used to snowboard. I'm from St. Louis. So I would go down this. It was called Hidden Valley, like a place that blows its own snow. It was really icy. So I learned on icy snow. Yeah. Um, but I've been snowboarding since I was in middle school. Um, but I snowboarded like once a year as I got older. So I go up to Winter Park and my buddy Luke and his brother jumps down this unmarked area in the trees. So excited to get fresh powder, right? Well, there were these pre-carved zones, not that much deeper than the width of a snowboard yeah. that you just kind of had to stay in. 
Yep. And you had to maintain enough speed. And, the, but there was also like really tight turns and yeah, I, I didn't know, exactly know how to make, about. I didn't know how to make such tight, precise turns. Yeah. And if I lose speed, I would get caught. Yep. So it was this constant battle of like, oh, I think I'm going too fast, but I also feel a little out of control, but I have to stay on this path. And then originally I just got too fast. I kind of freaked out and I hit a tree and you know how the powder around the base of a tree Tree well, can, yep. Can drop down. So essentially, to make the long story short, about two feet of snow got on top of my board. Yeah. I couldn't get out. Um, I was alone. Everyone else left and were down the thing. And I was like freaking out. I felt like I couldn't breathe. And I had eventually I like laid down to try and relax. And when I laid down, I realized I could lift my board out yeah. vertically and cut through the right. snow. And I I got out. And I was like, I'm never going in unmarked areas again. So <laughs> yeah. long story short, there's some commitment stuff in there. That was a good um, moment for, for sure. mindfulness for you, Av. You know? It was. I had to I had yeah. to for sure calm myself down because yeah. in the moment it was a nightmare scenario. But for sure. Yeah. Let's get to you're golf, just, shall we? <laughs> you're stoked you didn't end up head first in that tree. Well, that could have right? been sketchy. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Okay. Question one. This is from Cameron underscore McEwen. How to best tackle the mental fears of bad scores during a swing change. Mm. I'm going through this now. So this is something that's close to heart. I think a lot of people struggle with this. You're making a swing change. You want to commit to it. But there's also a lot of fear taking that to the course, especially with the score. So when you're working with your players, I know you have your 1% program and different things, yep. guys you work with and gals. How do you help them take this swing change to the score and battle the mental this is maybe one of the most common questions i get as a coach um and the thing is like if you've attached your identity to the score that you're going to shoot you'll almost never make a swing change because mm. if you feel that shooting five or ten strokes higher makes you a lesser person or you're going to be seen in the eyes of your, you know, playing partners as, as lesser than what they used to see you as, or just that fear of, you know, being worse than you were, you'll never commit to the swing change. Um, everybody has to struggle a little bit. There's just no way you can come out of the blocks and play as good or better tweaking anything, right? The brain is too powerful. Um, it's done the same movement pattern for too long. And it's just too ingrained. And so you need to remove your ego from the equation and say, you know what? I'm willing to sacrifice a handful of rounds score wise in the early goings so that I can play the rest of my life, the golf I want to play. And when you think of it that way, it's not that big of a sacrifice but if you're only thinking about the next round you're about to play and, oh, my God, what if I shoot 100, you'll revert right back to what you've been doing. So it's really like removing your identity from the score and saying, I'm out here to learn a new swing change. If I hit one shot that I wasn't capable of hitting prior to this swing change, it's worth it. I can see the benefits. I'm going to stick with it. But, you know, it's having that fear mentality of like, oh, my God, I don't want to be any worse than I am, you know, then you won't commit to it, if that makes sense. Sir, what did you and Daly keep telling me as I've been going through swing changes? You got to go out and play. What did you call it? What did I call it? Do you it? remember what you called it? No, because you're doing a lot of reps. practices. You need reps. Yeah. I need yep. competitive reps. I'm like, too much range time. You got the way you're going to learn is on the course, right? Yeah. Keith, I mean, that's it. And I think that was the key. That's been the key for me, Keith. And, and to, and to give Cameron, you know, it's sometimes I always want to make sure that it, it's easy when you talk about the mental side, like we do, that it can come off very theoretical. And I always yep. try and make sure people have the tactical as well. Um, because it's easy to say, you know, take your ego out of it, but it's deep ingrained in who we are. A lot of us obsessive golfers. So for me, as I've been going through swing changes and I think the most important thing I've learned, Serm's point 
and his college teammates point daily, who would tell me, you just need reps. I would treat it as let me try and understand what's happening and what are my precise struggles. So my coach, Josh, would say, I'm I'm trying to get you to play like an athlete. Let's try and, you know, have it set, feel the rhythm and release and try and see as many shots as you try and hit as many shots as you can with rhythm without trying because I try and kill it, you know, and that throws a lot of stuff out of whack. But then what happens when I didn't? Did I was it fear of the miss? Did I lose focus? And then when I did it, what was I focused on? So basically what I was doing to Cameron listening is I was recording data to then send to my coach, Josh. That's why follow-up lessons are even more important than the first one, because I can then say, hey, that thing that made so much sense in our lesson, I actually realized didn't. And I had all of these questions or it felt like this when I was out there. Yep. And my tendency was a high right when I was under pressure. Let's look at that. Why is that? Right? So I'm getting, I'm trying to get smarter. And that really helped me going back to the tactical to get out of the ego because I'm gathering information. I'm not trying to score well. I'm trying to learn. And I think that could be for every round, even not even people that are going through a swing change. I think that's what rounds are. I think you said this, Keith, didn't you say practice is studying? And playing is the exam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, exactly. I like to think of playing golf as the examination and my practice is studying for the exam. And so I want to know what am I going to be asked about on the exam, right? I'm going to be asked to hit shots that aren't my regular seven iron distance, right? I'm going to be stuck between a seven and an eight. I got to learn. I got to know how to hit a soft seven. So if I'm not practicing out on the range, I'm essentially saying I'm not preparing myself properly for the exam and every exam comes around every semester and lo and behold, I'm asked to hit a soft seven. And if I keep hitting full eights and full sevens on the range, mm. I'm not going to pass the cut. I'm not going to pass the course. And I'm sorry. Yeah. At some point that, that's on you, you know, to, th and you know, that's a bit of an aside from the swing change thing, but I think there's a really good process that also tiger said that he went through for his swing changes that I think makes so much sense where it's like, he wanted to see it look the way he wanted it on film on the range, right? He wanted it to see it the way he wanted it on film playing by himself, right? Then he wanted to take it to basically competition. And then he wanted to take it to a back nine when he had a chance to win. So like there's a process for it. I think as the coach, it's the responsibility to talk players through that process so that they're not going well, I've taken a few lessons with you. This should be translating to the course pretty quickly, right? And it's like, for some people, yeah, I've seen it where some people do take it right to the course. And it's like, you got it, man. Kudos. But other players, you know, that process doesn't work exactly the same. So I would say, you know, to Cameron, understand the, the likely process that the swing change is going to have to take before it takes hold to, on the golf course and just have have fun with it. Enjoy the better shots that you weren't able to hit a month ago, right? And let that fuel you and go, you know, I see the potential. It's not every time, but I see what I'm capable of if I do this right. And let that keep, you know, the snowball rolling. Yeah. And by the way, you can't improve or know that you need to practice the soft seven if you don't become aware that that was information that you experienced struggle or you didn't know yeah. how to do from the round. So again, if you're not gathering information from the round, you don't know that the next examination is going to have a soft seven that you have to practice and study for. But I would, yep. I would, I would say you have to practice it all the time, even if you yeah. struggle or not. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you have to, you know, cause it's always going to come up. Right. That's what I'm saying. People yeah, you're are always like going to be true. You're always going to be within yardages. That's a good point. People are, you know, my, my, my friend Nick said this the other day, he's like, Man, people come off the course and they're like, I just had a lot of in-between numbers today. And he's like, yeah, so you mean you played golf? <laughs> like, yeah. I just yeah. started cracking up. I was like, yeah. When are we going to figure out that we don't have just perfect 150-yard yardages? It's a nice smooth eight to a middle flag every time. <laughs> like, It just doesn't exist. And yeah. yet we're like, oh, man, I don't have that shot. Well, you better get that shot because it's coming up on the next exam, like tomorrow when you play again. <laughs> yeah.
Let's go. Wow. We're diving deep early here, right out of the gates. All right. Question two. This is from the Kyle beers who doesn't love that name. Um, no, I like it. This is, this is interesting. I struggle feeling like I deserve pars and birdies. What should I do? Wow. Deserve pars and birdies. This might be a whole, this might be a deeper topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we <laughs> go deep gone. on the train. <laughs> <laughs> we go deep well, here. What, what do you have to say for, to Kyle there, Keith? Kyle Beers. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's maybe almost taking, that might be taking it too, too deep for what it is. Like, golf is a game, right? It's a fun game. It's supposed to be played. It's supposed to be challenging. It's supposed to, it's supposed to test you. It's supposed to reward you in times, right? And I think if we attach too much meaning to this game, which is easy to do because it so parallels life in so many great ways. That's why I think we love the game so much. But I think if we put so much emphasis on these things, we psych ourselves out. And that's what it sounds like Kyle is doing. It's like putting too much emphasis on that five-footer for birdie. Like, I don't deserve this. Like, of course you deserve it. You've put in the time, you've practiced, you're there for five feet for birdie. You got yourself there. Like, of course you deserve it. Right. And it's a game. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to, you're not supposed to win every time, right? You're supposed to lose. If you won every time you'd get bored of the game, right? You're supposed to lose. That's what brings you back. So I would say like treat it a little bit more, this like a little bit more lightheartedly as far as like how much attachment you place to on these, uh, you know, these scores. And at the end of the day, let's think about what gets you that score. A score is just a culmination of good swings, right? Good shots are just good swings. Yeah, sometimes and just good, one. Sometimes all. just one. And so if you can put more emphasis on, hey, I'm going to make a good stroke or I'm going to make a good swing. And I really don't have any, I don't have anything to do with this outcome. If it hits a little pebble I didn't see on the green, this ball might not go in, right? If I can put a good stroke on it and I could say that I got myself mentally in a committed place to my target, that's all you can do. That's all you can do. And you go and do it on the next hole until you run out of holes and then you go and play again the next day. That, I love it. Yeah. I just played with a um, quick story. I played with uh, three older guys last week and we were talking about what we did and the podcast came up and he told me immediately, he goes, oh, I got to listen. I really struggle with short putts, Right. And there's this perceived uh, assumption that it should go in. Yep. And I told him about the thing we learned sir, from Dr. Joe Parent. And he asked us, are you allowed to put it in the hole? Or, no, we can't pick it up and put it in the hole. Your job is to get it started. So that makes me think for Kyle too. Like if you're getting, if you're standing over a putt as the example you gave Keith of like, not sure if I deserve this par or birdie. That's probably, that tells you if that's creating that tension, that's probably not the most productive thing to be thinking, where if your job is to get it started, I'd ask yourself, can you put it an inch in front of you? Yep. And did you put it over your mark? Yes or no? Yep. If it's yes, then you made your putt. And to your point, Keith, if you just do that, you're going to look up and you just might've made four pars in a row without thinking right. that you deserved it. So I right. think Kyle's question, it might sound deep. It might sound like, you know, he's taking everything too seriously, but it's a great reminder. This game, just like life is all about coming back. And that tells you, maybe I'm off track a little bit. I got to come back to what can help me, you know? So I think yeah. that was a good question. Yeah. Process over, over results. Right. So just get back into a, and I would do what I would tell for everybody is I would write it down, write down on a notepad, step-by-step what you're going to do next time you're in that situation. Because guess what? That feeling of, am I worthy? is going to come up on your next exam, right? Yeah. And yep. so you need a process, just like you have a process for solving a math problem. You have to have a process for beating that thought that's going to come up. And so if you have a step-by-step -step guide to do that, you'll run the steps and soon you'll be out of that, you know, fear-based outcome result mindset. Yep. It's All right. Third question, driver versus iron swing. I can't hit the big dog to save my life. 
help. This is from at J Rojo, something a lot of us struggle with or have struggled with. Yes. So the driver versus iron swing is, is interesting in that this happens all the time on my lesson T where someone comes in and they're hitting, they can really hit their driver well. And then they are thinning and chunking irons or vice versa. They can hit their irons quite solidly, but then they're popping their driver up or they're, you know, slicing their driver pretty substantially. Usually the best players can, the swing shape itself looks pretty similar. Like if you saw Rory swinging a six iron versus a driver, aesthetically very similar, but like what his feels are in the downswing and for the driver and the six iron are going to be quite different. Um, is he maybe thinking about those feels at this point in his career? Probably not. Does he think about them sometimes? Probably. But if he can't hit the big dog, but he can hit his irons, that tells me that his angle of attack is most likely, again, without seeing his swing, too steep, right? Too out to in. The hands in the club are too far out in front of him in transition. Now, with an iron, you can get away with that quite often, right? But with a driver, because it's teed up and it's not on the ground, that driver typically tends to slip right underneath that golf ball. Or if you do manage to make the compensations necessary, the path is so far out to end that you're likely to hit a pretty substantial slice to the right. So I would say that we need to, in general, get your path more shallow for both irons and driver. You might struggle a little bit with your iron delivery in the early goings, but your driver is going to get better instantly and you'll figure out your iron delivery quite easily um, in pretty short order. So again, always a little tough without seeing someone swing for like the variables they bring to the table. But that's, you know, when I see that come across, that's, that's typically what's going on. I think yes. that's pretty, I, I think that's a, that's a good explanation, Keith. And this next question ties right in. And I think this is an incredibly smart question and something that really kind of tells a story about struggles. Okay. Driver man gives me problems. I'm good and okay. When I look at the hole and I like the look of the hole, I'm not okay when I don't like what I see. This is from Carlos Manuel Diaz Milan. And um, I think that's it, Keith. I mean, cause we see guys, everybody can hit the driver when it's wide open. There's no trouble. Yep. If they hit a fade and it's a left to right hole. But talk about, so talk about this. I think this is, this is great. You know, I was watching the uh, live from the players championship this morning. Um, and Jack Nicholas was on there talking and he said this exact same thing. He goes, you know, some players will come to me and they go, man, this course just doesn't fit my eye. And Jack said, you know, it's not your job to have the course fit your eye. It's your job to fit your game to the course. And that was like, whoa, mm. that was an eye opener. Right. Mm. And it's like, well, yeah, Dustin Johnson has won at Harbor Town, like one of the shortest courses on the PGA Tour Rota. And he's won the Masters, right? A longer course. And it's like, Dustin just hit four irons off the tee all day long at, the, at Harbor Town and just wedged his way to victory. And so I think we need to, as golfers, understand that like, the cool thing about golf is that it's not a uniform playing field every time. It's not a soccer field or a basketball court where the dimensions aren't going to change. Wind changes, the holes change, the length of holes, everything changes all the time. And so it's like it's, it's solving a puzzle every time you step on a tee box. And it's, it's being able to step back and go, man, this might not be a driver on this par four today. Some days it is, but the wind, I don't like the wind today. I got to i gotta be able to hit a four iron out there to the corner of the dog leg and just, you know, normally I like to take it over the corner, but today it's just the wind isn't right. So it's having that adaptability to say, okay, I I can't do it the same way every time and having that that flexibility in your game. And again, this comes back to the examination question, like, Hey, if I think I'm going to go out there and it's going to be 72 degrees with no wind and the uh, green speeds are going to be the same every single time, like I'm going to be pretty shocked by that exam when I go out there from time to, from day to day. Um, and so when it doesn't suit your eye, you can't just sit there and hit the shot in fear. Your job is to be as committed as possible to the target and the shot that you've selected every time you step over a golf ball. 
So if that's a five iron off the tee on a par five, because that's the only club you can get and play that day, it's the five iron. It's not the driver. It's the five iron. It's the club. It really comes down to there's a big difference between hitting the shot that you think you should be able to hit and hitting the shot that you know you can hit. And too many people try to hit the shot they think they should be able to hit. And if they play the shot they know they could, their scores would be lower, but they'd also be more committed to the swing every single time. Keith, I think your example about DJ is so good for Carlos because we're talking about one of the greatest players of the last 30 years who only hits a cut off the tee. Yep. So when he sees a right to left hole, DJ's not trying to overcompensate and hit some slinging draw to match no. the golf hole. He's, right. Even for, so, Carlos, think about Dustin Johnson thinks, man, I don't love the look of this hole. <laughs> and there's going to be several of those, but yeah. I got to manage it to my strengths. So, talk about that a little bit as we. Yeah, that's so true. Carlos on his I, way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a great example, right? And it happens all the time. There are several holes on my home golf course that. I don't love the look of for whatever reason. I couldn't tell you why I don't love the look of it. It's just like my eye sees it and just doesn't prefer it. And then there's some holes that do, but what am I going to make a clod every time I play that hole just because I don't like it? Like, no, (laughs) I mean, that's not how you play the game. So you have to figure out a tee shot on those holes. And guess what? Those holes, those holes aren't changing unless they blow up the golf course and they change the layout of your golf course. They're always going to be there. So find the club you're most comfortable with. And understand, hey, you might not be able to make birdie on this hole. That's okay. A par or a bogey is going to be just fine. But we got to avoid those triples and those quads. And just because I'm not comfortable with a shot, that's no excuse to say, ah, keep making quad on this hole. Like, okay, let's figure out a different strategy. I'll give you a couple of quads, maybe two. But I'm not giving you a third quad and saying (laughs) this is okay. Like, figure out a different strategy at this point. Yeah. (laughs) I do want to jump in on this before we get to some short game questions. I do think this is important because for as someone who was deathly scared of hitting the hotel on the 18th at St. Andrews with 100 yards left fairway to recently striping more fairways than I can remember at a private club with a lot of nerves going through a swing change, something I've really learned, and this might be very specific or it might be helpful to a lot of people. I'm not sure. But one thing I've learned is the power of getting my foundations right, meaning my grip, understanding. I, I, I told my coach, like, it feels like I'm I'm unlocking doors that used to be access denied in, I, in my swing. Like some things just feel open now that used to feel like I was really stuck and had nowhere to go. Right. So I think getting that those foundations are huge. You can't do it without that. That's the power of lessons. Two is I have found every single time I try and rip one or every single time I try and really get under it or get around it or draw one, I block it because I think I just, it gets outside me. I get way too quick. And every time at this country club in LA that I just, my caddy kept saying, you have enough just do your normal swing. It would drop in the slot and I'd hit this perfect little baby cut or even a baby draw and pretty straight drive. And for someone, I'd never hit that straight of drives like ever. So it seems like, I know you want to get to a place where you rip your driver, but if your foundations aren't right and you've got a lot of residual issues like Carlos and um, Jay, wrote in about slowing it down has been huge. Letting the club just drop on it has been huge for me, not trying to manipulate or throw the head or do anything. That's been really, really helpful for me. Yeah. Everyone's got to find what their comfort zone is, what their keys are. Yeah. I mean, um, again, I want people to practice with the mentality of, okay, I'm standing over, I have nine holes to go to shoot my best score. Like how am I practicing for that? Because everyone wants to get there, but then they don't practice for when they're there. And so when they get there, it shocks them and they freak out. Right. Like, so I would rather you understand, okay, 
if I can mentally conjure up a little bit of nerves on the range, right, even though they're maybe not quite as nervy as I'm going to feel on the course, you can still mentally trick yourself a little bit into those feelings. And it's like, okay, what am I going to do in that moment? And to your point where you're like, stay within myself, slow down, right? Like let the club fall on the ball. Those have turned into keys that you've seen success with. And then your brain starts to link those things with success, helping you overcome that anxiety. And then now you have a powerful tool for the next time you're in that situation. Yeah, Keith, just to, this is great conversation. Just to wrap this up and this question and to have, I mean, when we get to these holes we don't like, oftentimes we just think we have to hit the most amazing shot to overcome this moment. Right. When really to what you were getting in about club section, no, we just have to stop, dig in, really strategize and just maybe take a different club and a different line and a different yeah. shape. <laughs> but yeah. I just wanted to add that in. Yeah. Well, that kind of, that kind of checks off uh buttercut pot buttercuts pods question of making poor choices on the course, always thinking about the hero shot. Right. I think that answer kind of applies to that too. So next question, David Duvall 36 asks the real David Duvall. Not sure if this, I don't <laughs> think it's the real one. Double D. <laughs> Double D probably feels like he's the real Oakley's one. Oakley's wraparound. All, you know, he's his true David Duvall self in his own way. Uh, a lot of inconsistency with 20 to 50 yard shots help. And then Bretsky 64 asked in the same notion, I've lost all confidence with my wedges. We'll get to that second, but let's start with 20 to 50 yard shots. Yeah. Practice hard. some more. <laughs> practice some more. They're hard. <laughs> yeah. They're hard because, and I empathize with this with a lot of people with my students. I go, where around you do you have a really good, well mown, not crazy crowded practice facility where you can do that and hit your own golf balls, like hit a, a bag of your own balls that you play with. And everyone said, I don't have that, right? Unless you're a member at a private club, which, you know, few of us are. So it's just a matter. It's simply like if it's, if it's a technique thing, right, then that's, you know, a, 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 a conversation in itself. If it's merely a reps thing, then you have to find quiet moments on the golf course in the late afternoons or early mornings to get out on the golf course and practice those shots. If you don't have those at your disposal, because practicing them off of, you know, mats at the range, isn't going to get it done from, for those types of shots. Um, so I'd be curious to know if it was a, a technique thing here. That's, that's why he's struggling or if it's just merely like, I don't know the length of swings to be making. I don't know how much effort to put into these shots. Cause those are two very different like directions you could go. Keith, what, I mean, obviously we'd say 20 to 50 yard shots. If we are going over a bunker, if we have a tight pen, the feel is just cha is always challenging. What, what's your thoughts there? And, and maybe that's around mental, but you gotta be a little smarter with, with your line, but talk about and that target. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think it comes back to hitting the shot you know you can hit and not the shot you think you should hit. Every time in my lessons, I get players to use less loft around the greens. Mm. Um, rarely do I have players hit a lot of shots with 60-degree wedges. Um, I, get, I introduce people to pitching wedge-like motions and nine irons, um, and we even talk about putting from off the green. Like I have people practice putting from off the green. I mean, Martin Keimer won a U.S. Open at Pinehurst putting around bunkers, right? Like – it's about getting the ball in the freaking hole. It's not about how it looks. It's not about, Hey, this is the shot that Rory hit in the Ryder cup and zipped it in there and stopped on a dime. Like it's about doing what is going to get you the best outcome 10 times out of 10 and not, you know, the coolest looking outcome once out of 10. Um, so like from a mentality standpoint, I change people's perspectives chipping all the time by teaching them just like, a putting stroke with a pitching wedge or nine iron. It's like a, basically like a putt chip or like putting with loft is kind of what I call it. Um, and people are like, they're like, Oh, I've never even used a pitching wedge around the green or, or never even thought to use a nine iron. Right. Um, and it opens up their world. So unless you have to go over a bunker, take less loft, please. It's going to help you immensely. Now, why can't someone, if someone's listening and they're thinking, well, 
if it's a distance thing, why can't I practice that at the range? Are those reps better than no reps? Let's dig into your comment about why the rings won't help on these shots. So hitting off of mats, right? Like you can't, you can hit it two inches heavy and the ball will still fly perfectly. Like, and that's not good feedback for short shots around the green. Cause that tells you if you're doing that consistently and maybe you don't have the awareness quite yet that you're hitting it a little heavy, right? Then you get on the course and that's going to be a big surprise for you when you chunk it or you thin it over the green. And you would need to be working on your low point being more ahead of the golf ball in that certain, you know, in that scenario. Now, could you work on length of swing if you're making solid contact? Yes, you could. The other thing is issue wise with range balls, as I'm sure you found out, if, if you play a premium, you know, a soft covered golf ball, it uh, launches lower with more spin. So if I'm practicing with a top flight range ball, it's going to launch high with no spin. So my feel for a 20 yard shot with a top flight is immensely different than my feel with a pro V one or whatever mm. premium ball you play simply because of how it reacts and how it flies. So like my brother, David, who's a PGA professional taught me this long ago. Like one of the first things he gave me was one of his old bags of, of, you know, slightly used balls to go practice. He said, never putt or chip with a range ball. Right. That was one of the first things he instilled in me. And I haven't to this day because it just, it doesn't do your feel any good. Now, again, that's why I'm saying most people don't have access to this. So the next best thing you could do is practice the length of swing that is required to a 20 yard target with the range ball off of a mat. Is it better than nothing? Absolutely. Right. But there is a transition that has to be made unless you're playing with the exact range ball you practice with on the course, you will see a different flight. I did a, a video with this for some of my, uh, online subscribers i hit just a, a 10 yard shot with a with a premium ball and a 10 yard shot with a range ball and the spin was a thousand spin less with the range ball and and two degrees higher launch and so it's like it's just harder to gauge yeah now bretsky 64 says he's lost all confidence with his wedges now obviously one downside of written in questions is I can't follow up and understand more context. Does he mean full shots? Let's right. assume every shot with a wedge in his hand, he's lost all confidence and we can all relate to this. You have enough bad outcomes with a certain club or group of clubs in your bag. It doesn't feel good when you have to go then hit it. So where do you start with a player here that's lost all their confidence with their wedges? Normally that comes from them trying like making too big of a swing. So for me with wedges, you look at all the best wedge players and none of them made full swings. Phil Mickelson being a perfect example. Um, Tiger being a perfect example. Stricker being a perfect example. Luke Donald, all these phenomenal the wedge players, yeah. the best. They all had abbreviated backswings and abbreviated follow throughs. They never tried to, they could on the range, maybe max out their 60 degree, a hundred yards but they probably never tried to hit it more than 75 yards on the golf course. And so I would say for most people struggling with their wedges, it's truly take your backswing back to about lead arm parallel to the ground. So for right-handed players, that's your left arm, basically like going back to like nine o'clock or you know, lead arm parallel to the ground and swing forward to trail arm or right arm parallel to the ground. So like a nine o'clock to three o'clock swing with your arms and see how far that ball is going. I promise you your contact is going to get better and you don't need to hit it any further than that with your wedges. Right. And your, and your, your flight will get a little lower, which is all what all wedge player, best wedge players do. And your contact will improve. So again, without much context or seeing their swing, shorten that baby up and, and you'll be playing better wedge play pretty quickly. Keith, I think you would probably say to a little bit, a little back in the stance, Right with these wedge shots. I mean, we're trying to drive these things in low, you know, or medium trajectory, at least talk about that. Yeah. Um, forward ball position is the killer of most amateurs games from my experience, just across the board from driver through every club in the bag. Um, and that's part of the reason they come over the top. It's a big reason anyway, that they come over the top is because the ball position is too far forward. So, with the wedges, I like to see it about a half a ball back of center. I don't like to get it too far back because then divots get really deep and the path gets moving way out to the right. So 
like Hogan said, if you move it too far back in your stance, you got to offset it by opening your stance so that your swing direction is more neutral. So there's some compensations that have to be made if the ball gets way far back, but a little back of center is definitely where I like to see the ball position. And Ev, don't you think when we have a wedge in our hand, we feel like back to our word deserve, we deserve to have a birdie chance, but we have a yeah. 700 or 600 hand. We're just happy if it's on the green. And, th- right, and yep. this is a whole messed up perception and, and approach. I think we often struggle with. Well, think about a par five, right? You're, let's say you're 30 yards off the green. And you put it to 20 feet. Well, let's say 15 feet. You're probably like a little disappointed. Oh, I really would have loved the tap and birdie. We all know the stats and everything um, of pros and it helps us manage our expectations. But the funny thing is, is if you put any other approach shot on a par four, a long par four, where you're hitting a mid to a long iron and you put it 15 feet and you've got a 15 foot look for birdie, you're pretty pumped. Right. Yep. So it's just our perception of what we deserve to your point, sir, that determines our emotional reaction to it. Yeah. So that's true. really well said. Really well said. I think I think that's why people feel better about laying up to a hundred yards on par fives, because a wet, you know, if they hit that that a hundred yard wedge to fifteen feet, they're like, Yeah, stuffed it. Great shot. To your point, the same 30 yard chip to 16 feet, one foot further away feels like a horrible outcome. Yeah. And, and it's probably going to lend itself to the same score or maybe a lower score. If you keep going from, if you, if you hit a hundred shots from 30 yards, your average proximity is going to be infinitely tighter than your hunt, your at proximity from a hundred yards. But you know, we can only see one outcome at a time. We don't get to like play a simulation in our game to go, you know, Oh, from a hunt for a hundred in a row, I'm going to be better from 30 yards than I am from a hundred. All right, Keith, you want to sneak in a putting question and then maybe end with one or two more around the mental and preparation. So this is interesting um, because it gets maybe a little into mechanics, but um, okay, pulling putts, struggling with the line and having the confidence to roll it where I want to. Um, This is from Nick underscore Gunther. Pulling putts, getting offline quick, the the dreaded feeling. Um, Yeah. Talk about this. I think if you look at the best putters throughout time and all putters really on the PGA tour, if you opened up the golf bag of every player on the PGA tour, aside from a handful, they're all going to have a, some sort of mirrored putting device in their bag. Right. And they're all going to use some sort of drill that helps them start their ball online. You know, famously tiger would put two T's on either side of his putter face on the toe and the heel. And he would basically use it as a gate to make sure that he was making center face contact and to make sure that his path was moving towards the target at impact. A um, couple of my favorite devices uh, are the Pell's putting tutor or the putting plates. Um, these are two devices that basically you put them on the ground, you aim it at the hole. It's got two slots for you to put tees in at the end of the device or two little marbles in the case of the Pell's putting tutor. And if you pull it offline, you'll knock one of the little marbles out of its little holster. And you basically just use that as feedback until you can roll the ball through the marbles or roll the ball through the tees. So this is the easiest fix of all putting thing, putting mechanics, because it's just about doing some, you know, just productive practice and learning what it feels like. Most people who pull it have to feel like they're pushing it to just to hit a straight putt because to them, it has to feel like they're going to leave the face open to not pull it. Um, but you'll find out really quick and you'll get a pretty darn quick solution by, uh, by getting some of these drills in place. Come on, Nick, you got to write these down. These, these devices, these are some, just, it's just old school. And you just, that's, a, that's also a great example. Feedback. Why is every player in the world at a PJ or whatever pro event has a mirror and yep. no one at a country club does. And no they're the one. best putters or, or yep. what, or just having an alignment stick or a club down or. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I so, mean, yeah. Putting is one ahead. of those things. I always tell people, it's like, you're never going to drive it like Rory or, or, or your, you know, or Adam Scott, but like you could put it like Cam Smith in a couple of months. If you just put in some time, like putting is not a complicated skill. It's yeah. just moving a moving a, a flat faced object a few inches back and a few inches forward. It's literally just putting in the time 
and nobody wants to because hitting balls is you know more fun. And to your point earlier off air, Keith, you said hashtag daily deposits on your story every day. And yeah. I used to have a little putting uh, gate. Uh, some of them have it where it has a little gate you can put on carpet. And yeah. I used to do that before bed. I used to love it's so easy. You don't doesn't matter if you put it in a hole. All yep. you're doing is seeing how many times you can put it through the gate and start yep. it online. And yep. you do that every night for fun. You, yep. you, it is crazy how much better you start to roll the putt because you have confidence that you can start it online. And I like the idea of not putting it to a hole because the yeah. outcome doesn't matter, right? Like it's out of your hands, really. Yeah, so the hole you can is just... can you start it online? Right. Yeah. And most people, when I put them, when I give putting lessons, can start to do that within 10 tries. It's not an overly complicated skill, yeah. and, but it's, but it's a practiced skill that obviously is just a matter of reps. All right. We've got two. Let's see if we can fit, squeeze in two more. I may want to then finish with daily deposits. This got me thinking, Keith, this is good. So go ahead. Have, okay. keep going. Nick Delgado 21 asks, and I think this is a really good one. We haven't addressed this specifically on the show before, but how to focus we talk about it all the time, but how to do it, how to pick it, how to focus on just one swing thought. How do you help your players get their one thought? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's an experimentation process. So we have things or looks or, or, or positions we're trying to put the golf club in. And what the player has to do, what I've done, what other, all other players that I've talked to about this have done, is you have to figure out what thought gets most of the positions that you're trying to get to to take care of themselves. So for me personally, I work really hard on keeping the club head a little outside my hands going back, like up to a club shaft parallel. That's always been something I've worked hard on. And I found through videoing my swing that if I do that, most of the positions I want at the top are there. And my transition is better because the club is where I need it to be. And so with my fault being to pull the club head inside early, that's what I did all through college and my youth. Keeping that club head outside my hands helps me hit it straighter with less draw. Um, and I've just had to find that through trial and error. So it's not a lot of these things that people are, are searching for in the golf swing have to be found through self-discovery. And I think a coach's job is almost like, guided self-discovery if yeah, it's you like will a filtration like, system don't you think yeah like you don't want a coach that gives you everything because then there's no yeah. rewarding aha moment for yourself and that's what's the most powerful you know thing in life and in golf is like when you figured it out for yourself it clicks so much more than if you're just you know fed it by somebody mm -hmm. so it's a it, it's a process that players have to go through themselves it's very individualistic now a coach is there to help bounce ideas off of and you know basically kind of tell you if you're in the right vein based on their expert eye of what the swing looks like when you say you're doing this thing um but it really should be up to the player because at the end of the day the coach can't stand there and hit shots for you on the back nine you know when you're trying to shoot a good score he can't stand there with a camera on the golf course when you're trying to get it it's on you and you've got to figure it out for yourself and it's that's why it's a highly individualistic game but that's why it's so rewarding when you do it because you know it wasn't it was you and it wasn't anybody else. Yeah. And I will say having a coach, I've talked about it a lot recently. It is such a stress reliever because before, when you're trying to find your swing thought, you go out one round, it might not be working, but you don't know that that's the thing that's not working. It could be a thousand other things. It could be hoping that this is the one thought, but when you have someone to help you and be a pressure tester and be a filtration system. You can say, Hey, this is what I'm feeling. Is this in line with what we're going for, what we're working towards? And they can yep. say yes or no. And you bring it back and you build on it. So without that, there's a lot of guesswork and you're probably trying to fix something that isn't the thing that's causing it. And it, that's what creates frustration and hitting your head against the wall. Trust me. I did it for decades over almost two decades. So um, yep. that's another thing I'd throw in there. Last question, sir. You want to give him the last one from T chats 89. Yeah. Um, how to acknowledge your miss without it becoming a negative thought. Talk about maybe what some might call the post shot routine, Keith. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, I think 
How about these questions from our passengers today? Yeah, Pretty good. Questions. And there's a ton of good ones we need to get to. We might have to have a second episode. Of really <laughs> yeah. good stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, the misses are going to happen. We're not robots. We're humans, which means that we're prone to error. We're disposed to error, right? We're, we're ever evolving. We're ever changing. Um, standing over a shot, concerned about the miss. Somebody said something really, like, really profound to me. They were like, if you're going to give as much time thinking about what bad could happen, it's only fair that you give equal time thinking about what good could happen. And cool. I, I'm not saying like stand over the shot saying this is going to be a perfect one after you've hit 50 crappy shots. Like, I think that's a bit, you know, nobody's going to do that, but I, there is a big power in just standing there and visualizing what you want to have happen and being fully committed to that shot. And I think like, you know, the OG goat, Dr. Bob Rotella, you know, said it, you know, uh, an interview I was listening to that was just so good. He's like, do you think a good swing with a shitty attitude is, you know, is any better than a, than a, or, or I mean, a bad swing with a bad attitude is better than a bad swing with a good attitude. It's like, what do you want? Do you want both? Do you want the compounding of the bad swing and the bad attitude? Or do you want, you know, a bad swing and good attitude? And Yes, it's maybe a little simplistic, but unless your misses are happening 75% of the time, which most people aren't in my experience, you got to be standing there thinking about like the good stuff that could be happening. I mean, whether you think about bad or you think about good, you know, you're both right, you know? So it's, you know, that, that's kind of what it comes down to. That's great. What you're saying is don't ignore the commonality in your miss that's important no. to be aware of but going into a shot acknowledging that but then refocusing on where you want it to go i think that's what you're saying you gotta it's not yes. just about avoiding the miss you have yep. to focus on where you're trying to hit it while acknowledging the past misses right yeah you acknowledge your past misses by picking appropriate targets yeah and then you go okay i've i've a picked appropriate target but now i'm gonna really hone in on hitting at that tree that i've selected so yeah. I'm all for acknowledging what's out there that you don't want to go towards, but then reframing and going, okay, I've, I've acknowledged that that's done. We're, we're not going to dwell on that. Now we're going after the corner of that bunker out there in the fairway uh, with all of our commitment. And if you hit a bad shot, you hit a bad shot. I mean, it's golf. How many bad shots do we hit around? It's, it's endless, but you just have to keep running that mental process because you know, it's better. It's more productive than the alternative. Before we let them go, sir, we're, yeah. we're pretty much at time. You want to bring up daily deposits? I do. I want to sign off with this, Keith. That was a great mailbag guest series. Keith, sign off and tell our listeners, I'm going to ask you a question and then and then dig in a little bit here. Tell us what the deposit system is, the change jar, as you call it. Yep. And tell our listeners how they can use that system after a bad round, a bad yeah. practice session, because I think you're going to get into about how to get many wins and and, and, and feeling successful that day. So dive yep. in and, and send us home here. Yeah, it, it comes along to like having a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset or mm -hmm. being a process mindset versus an outcomes mindset. And so I was just, we have a change jar in our, in our cabinet here at home. And it's just one of those things. And, and maybe, you know, the current generation, we're a very uh, cashless society currently, but you know, you'd have a couple pieces of change in your pocket and maybe you just dump it into a little, uh, you know, jar at home in, you know, in passing when you're cleaning out your pockets in the night. And over time, at the end of the year, before you know it, you've got 50, 75, even $100 in that change jar at the end of the year. And you go, oh, sweet, I'm going to buy myself a new X, Y, or Z. And it's, and it's not like you were trying to save. It just was like this sweet bonus at the end of the year. And it got me thinking of like, you know, even if I had a bad range session, if I really sat there and thought about it, I got something out of that that I could take into my, ne my next practice. Maybe it was even like acknowledging that I shouldn't be practicing if my mindset or if I'm exhausted or like that's a revelation in itself. Mm. Like, hey, this is counterproductive. That's still a win. That's a learning yeah. moment. That's a daily, that's a deposit in the ATM that you're going to withdraw from later on. Right. So 
if you're not putting those deposits in, you've got no withdrawal. You've got, you don't have anything to withdraw. So you've got nothing to, to go back to. And, you know, just little practice sessions, swinging your golf club in slow motion for five minutes a day. That's a deposit, right? Hitting a few putts through the gate before you go to bed, Evan. That's a deposit, right? It's like it all adds up. And I think we're looking for this big fireworks parade moment where we get to a single digit and everybody throws us this big, happy, you know, celebratory thing. And as you all know, when you pass, you know, milestones in your life, it doesn't happen. It's just another day goes by. And so if we're obsessed with those thinking of these things in these big celebratory things, we're going to be super disappointed. So it's like really shifting your mind into like the process of putting a penny in the jar and that's the, that's the goal. That's the goal. That's not even the process. That is the goal. It's just to put a penny in the jar and leave it at that. Yeah. I love it. That's love perspective. It. It's great for our listeners, Keith. Yeah. It's just yeah. like someone trying to lose weight, you know? Yep. If you think you want to get under 200 pounds or whatever, and you're 250 now. Yeah. If you're checking the scale every day, you're probably going to be pretty frustrated. Yeah. But yep. if you put in a daily workout every day and you try and eat better every day, you lift your head up, just like the round we were talking about, about being scared of, or doesn't, not deserving pars and birdies. You look up, you make a few pars, you look up, you've lost 30 pounds, yep. you know, same thing. So Keith, thank you so much, guys. If yeah. you like what you heard, which I don't know if you could, if how you couldn't have, <laughs> uh, follow Keith at Keith Bennett golf. That's two N's, two T's. Yes, and thank you. <laughs> we're gonna need to have you back, or even do this in person in yeah, Arizona when we come out and see you. And I want to do a deep dive on the mental side of snowboarding and extreme sports, and relate yeah. that to because it's very unique to have gone through that and now as a golf coach and a great player yourself. So uh, maybe that's uh, podcast two when we bring you back on the train. Hey, anytime you guys want to let me aboard the train, I'll uh, I'll hop on and and, and uh, I'll enjoy the ride, as they say. Hell yeah! All right, <laughs> thanks, Keith. Thanks, Keith. Great to see thanks you. Thanks so much, guys. It was a lot of fun. We'll uh, chat soon.